My name is Wes Pope. I teach at the University of Oregon. And uh, just wanted to say thank you for showing up. This is an incredible turnout. All the Oregonian Plus members who showed up and some faces that I know. So uh, welcome. Thanks for, thanks for coming by. We, um, th this sort of, this portion of it came together uh, sort of uh, at the last minute, but uh, it's really exciting that we were able to connect with the Oregonian. Um, this is something that, uh, this, that we were doing already for our students. We were bringing in uh, Brad and Rod uh, for the benefit of our students, and uh, it just turns out that we, we get to share them with you as well. Um, I just want to let you know real quickly about who we are and what we're doing. Uh, we uh, have a program at the White Stag Building. Some people may or may not be aware. Uh, we teach multimedia journalism and strategic communications are our two uh, graduate programs. We're also the home to the Agora Journalism uh, Center, which is the Center for Journalism Innovation and Civic Engagement. Um, brand new, which is just launching in the last couple months. Um, that program is run by Andrew David Gall, um, formerly of the New York Times. We just were lucky enough to hire him uh, just a couple months ago to run that center. So uh, in my program that I teach in, we're only two years old. So these are brand new things that the uh, University of Oregon uh, Journalism School is uh, are, is recently launching here in Portland, so we just want to let you know that we exist and we are um, we are here um, for a reason um, to to be part of the Portland media landscape. So we want we are um, looking for new ways to interact and, and work with uh, Portland um, uh, media and. Um, any, anyhow, that's who we are. If anybody wants to find out more about our programs come talk to me after this is over and I would be happy to share more information. Um, without further ado, I'll let, um, I'll let Bruce take over, but Brad Smith, Sports Illustrated, Rod Marr, the Seattle Seahawks, and, and not a player. Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> blew my yeah, cover. I just want to clarify. <laughs> Future running back. That's right. Not a swimsuit model, not a player. <laughs> Future swimsuit That's model? Not Never. <laughs> Before pictures, I'm a before picture. <laughs> well, welcome to beautiful, sunny Portland, Oregon. It's typical, yeah. typical weather here. Uh, so let's start off with a kind of a softball question. Uh, I'm curious. Both of you guys have shot and been around all kinds of sporting events. Is there any sporting event in the history of mankind that you wish you could go to, be at? And would you be the photographer, or would you just sit and enjoy it and watch it? That's you. Well then, I, I wanted him to go first so that I could think of my dream assignment and while Brad Smith, the director of <laughs> photography at Sports Illustrated, and occasionally my boss is sitting here, then he could be like, oh yeah, maybe I will send Rod to the wife carrying championships or whatever yeah. that one is in, uh, yeah. in Europe. I would love to shoot a World Cup final. I would love to shoot a World Cup final, I think. Um, we in America tend to think of the Super Bowl as the greatest sporting event in the world, but clearly once you travel outside the boundaries of the United States, you realize very quickly that the World Cup is the be-all, end-all. And uh, I think for me, it would be amazing to be able to witness that. Even if you can time travel, you can go back any time, that's it? You want to go to see, shoot next year's World Cup? Yeah, because they made all the photos at the other ones, so. <laughs> it's done. Oh, I get to take my cameras with me, so I could go to, like, the chariot races and be, like, the only exactly. one with the photos? Exactly. Could I get a leading off, Brad, with that? I believe if you I shoot it horizontally, I think you could. <laughs> <laughs> Just as long as we don't have to put the gutter through Charlton Heston's All right, head. that's good. <laughs> How about you, Brett? Uh, well, as an editor, I never, never have been a shooter, so I come at it from a different angle altogether, so I pretty have been fortunate enough to cover most everything I could think of sporting wise uh, big events uh, been to most of them uh, around the world Olympics and uh, Super Bowls and all those kind of things but um, the one event currently that I would want to go to that I've never been to is Wimbledon I'd like to go to Wimbledon someday just to kind of like see how hoity they can actually be um, <laughs> in person and then, if I could go back, I would go to the 1936 Olympics with Jesse Owens. I think that's awesome. uh, looking, not the, so much the Hitler part, but the um, uh, Owens part would be kind of cool, I think. So, just to clarify my political yeah. standards. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think a lot of people are curious about uh, the, the cover of your magazine, uh, the process of choosing it. Mm -hmm. How often is it, how, how far in advance is it planned? 
Does it get nixed at the last second? How often? Uh, just maybe some background on yep. that. Uh, excluding the swimsuit issue, which is done by a different department altogether, it's literally its entire staff is separate. So not counting that issue, um, we have two options. One is we just do the breaking news as things kind of happen and we have to react to things. And for sports, that doesn't happen very often because the majority of things we cover have a time frame on it. And the game's Thursday, we cover the game and we do the game. Um, once in a while something happens, it tends to almost always you know, be a big dramatic moment or whatever, like the Boston Marathon bombing was something we reacted to literally with three hours before we closed. Uh, it happened that morning on Monday and uh, by the afternoon is when it all started unraveling and really understand what's going on. We closed at seven and three o'clock in the afternoon we started looking at photos for a magazine that doesn't usually work that way. Um, and then once in a while a story falls in our lap, Jason Collins announcing he was gay as a basketball player just kind of came to us all of a sudden. Uh, but for the most part, we do know ahead of time. And if it's going to be action-oriented, then I send people, my uh, uh, group of uh, staff photographers and freelance photographers that I've had, and, and uh, Rod is one of those freelancers that I would call and say, we're doing a story on, let's just say, Russell Wilson is a good example. Can you cover the game for us on Sunday? And just really focus on him. We'll go shoot a game specifically for that, a couple of things. And then get the photos in on Monday and, and pick it that day. Um, feature photography, on the other hand, portraits, is different. We plan that out ahead of time as much as possible, and we try to get those photos in in case it doesn't work and we have to have a fallback. But uh, usually it's, it's a, a couple of days worth of working through it, and we have meetings and creative meetings, and sometimes they're a little over thoughtful, but uh, we eventually arrive there. So that's basically our big choice is whether some, an athlete is in action or whether it's a portrait. That's, that's kind of how that works. Uh, Rod, so, so Rod, both Rod and Brad have backgrounds in newspapers. Brad was at the New York Times yeah. and other places, be, including Sports Illustrated before that. Rod was at the Seattle Times for a long, 20 years, yep. is that right? Yes. Uh, that's a while. Uh, now he is a team photographer for the Seattle Seahawks. So I'm curious, in your role at the, at the Seattle Times, how is it different than your role for the Seahawks? I think Or when, similar? OK, I think, um, obviously, then, my background is in photojournalism. And as a photojournalist, you're always curious about what's on the other side of that door and what's on the other side of that wall. And every one of you in here who has a, who's a journalist, like that's what you want to know. Like, what, what can you tell someone, some, one of your readers, one of your viewers, that they, that they don't know that they can't see? And so I'm now privileged to be on the other side of the locker room door, to be on the other side of the meeting room door. And I'm fortunate that I have bosses in Pete Carroll and John Schneider, who's our general manager, that they encourage me to document our team. And so I'm actually getting to do a form of photojournalism in that all the photos I do aren't PR related, they're very <laughs> storytelling. It's share our experience with our fans. Um, Coach Carroll's never really said anything about what I should do or shouldn't do, um, other than we can't bring our fans everywhere. We don't get to bring them on the plane. We don't get to bring them to the team hotel. We don't get to bring them to our practices at the Super Bowl. So <laughs> my job then is to show them what it's like. Do you shoot those pictures, but they're not shared with the public? Are they documented? Oh, oh we document the everything. Plane? and we. Oh, yeah, we, we share a lot of things on Instagram. And I don't know. There are Seahawks fans here, but if you follow our Instagrams, you will see pictures from the airplane, from the meeting rooms, from team meals, from guys walking to buses, uh, guys messing around after practice in the weight room. We try and really um, share all those moments with our fans. If I can add to that from an editor's point of view, there are times where we want to do a story. And then right now, currently, the Seahawks are a very good team. And then. At some point, they won't be, and the interest won't be as high. But right now, they are. And we call Rod, and he's one of the guys that we can call who works for the team. And a lot of times, it's our benefit to call the inside person, the team photographer, because they already have the access, and they have the trust of the coach. And Because uh, ultimately, every sports team, it's about the head coach. And if they don't want you there, then no matter what, you're not going to get any right. time with anyone. And apparently, Pete Carroll is one of those guys that allows Rod to do his thing and lets us in. And we'll hire Rod, who we just hire him as a freelancer, independent of him working for the team. Now, when he shoots that, he still works for the team. He's not going to give us anything that's you know detrimental in any way. And that's fine. I'm not looking for that anyway. But um, 
we would hire somebody who has access like that. It really helps us a lot because they can get an inside um, look and they can have the trust of the players, which is really important. Mm -hmm. uh, something that I was reading while well, preparing for this, uh, I, I got to read these stats. Uh, uh, America employs 4.6 public relations specialists for each reporter, up from a margin of 3.2 to 1 in 2004 and 1.2 to 1 in 1980. Obviously, this is an issue uh, for politics and business and local government, but does it does it matter in the world of sports? They, at four point six. Who? Publicists, you said. PR. Oh yeah, PR, PR. people. Yeah. Which which mm -hmm. I sorry. would argue is the position that Rod holds for the Seahawks. No. Um, I uh, would say know, that you know, he's form. part of that layer. He's he's not the one, but it's there's a collective group that are working for the Seahawks brand. And Rod is one of those people who works for the Seahawks brand. Um, I have a relationship with Rod that if I needed to get access to the team and I want to do a story on Russell Wilson and could we hang out with him as he goes to visit some kids on a Thursday on his off day or whatever, can you do that? I would call Rod directly because I know him and I have a relationship with him. But he would never say yes without checking with the team first. He would never just say, oh, yeah, sure, I'll do that. He still has to ask somebody who works for the team so they're aware of it. Um, so there is that, that part of it. If I don't know somebody on the team or we don't have relationships with them, the PR people, who are that's who you have to go through. The rule in sports is during the season, you have to go through that PR person for the team. If they're not in season, like football is not in season right now, if I wanted to get in touch with Peyton Manning, I wouldn't go through the Broncos, I would go through his agent. So that's how you have to have both of those relationships at the same time. And they're not always, uh, they're not always compatible. The agent may want one thing for his player and the team may want something else. So frequently you have to kind of uh, weigh who's going to be able to give me what I need, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, the team will often say, no, the access isn't available, but the agent realizes this is very productive for his player and, and they'll give us access. So we have to just kind of play those two together. But um, we always go through PR. I never call LeBron directly. Well, he doesn't call me back, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's interesting that you bring that up because you asked me about being on the journalism side of the fence and now being mm -hmm. on the Seahawks side of the fence. Um, as people who are journalists know, a great deal of PR people now are former journalists, and so it's kind of yeah, interesting to right. wade into those waters. And so you uh, often we're working with, maybe not so much in sports, but in the corporate world, you know, we're working with PR people who are former journalists. So everybody's kind of speaking a common language, although now they're sometimes guarding different forts. Yeah. Right. It seems like that, like I said, or like I was asking, uh, in other world, worlds, that's not a problem, but it doesn't. It never has seemed to have been, been a problem in the sporting world. I think people look at it as entertainment versus something we're uncovering. You know. Yeah, I, I think a PR person's basic job is to protect the brand that they work for. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know if there's anyone who has that job in this room or anything, but I mean, that's your job. It's not to tell bad things about, oh, Exxon spills oil. You say Exxon provides gasoline. You know, I mean, that's that's the job is to, is to protect that brand. And I understand and I appreciate that. So I have to, you know, you go through and you try to ask for their time. And, and uh, you know, it, there's a lot of people asking for everyone's time. And most people are asking for the same people's time, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, right now, as I said, the Seahawks are a popular team. and. They get more requests now in the last four years than they probably did in the history of the franchise, total. And then in 10 years from now, when so-and-so's not there and they're four and eight again or whatever, then you don't call. That's how it works. It works, it, it's, it's fluid. It comes and goes. Um, so I think that PR people, they work for the brand. I understand that and you know it's a necessary evil that that's how, who you have to go through. But. You know, everybody. Everybody needs a buffer to reach the person that you're trying to reach, anyway. So, um, <clears throat> Rod, would you say most of what you're dealing or how your work is put out there is social media now? Facebook, Twitter. A lot of it lot is of social media. A lot of it is Instagram. A lot of it is Facebook. A lot of it is Twitter. But also, the pictures that I shoot also go in our game programs, our printed materials, season tickets, on the tickets themselves billboards, um, any kind of advertising, any sort of printed medium that we would do, and now increasingly, obviously, web medium. 
but yeah, it's kind of everywhere. So to accomplish that, especially the, the Facebook posts and everything, sure. your workflow has changed dramatically from the days. And I'd love to go back in time with Brad to talk about how the workflow, you know, carry couriers and airplanes and uh, but sure. what is your workflow now well How do you get it's not only just quickly? it's not only just the social media aspect right it's the it's just the web aspect right. makes everything faster i think 10 years ago the team photographer for the seahawks would shoot a game and he could just get on the plane and fly home and then develop his film and then the next day like there'd be pictures um now after a game we have an hour and a half probably before our plane leaves we leave right after a game so we're on the road, we play a game, the players do media, they change, they shower, we get on buses and we head to the airport. And in that time, I'm gonna look through 3,000 photos and edit them down to about 50 to 75, um, and then crop them, keyword them, color correct them, and upload them <coughs> while packing all my own gear and getting myself ready for the plane. So. That part has definitely changed. It's, um, it's a lot faster. When we board a plane to go out of town, I'll take pictures on, you know, as we're going on the bus, guys are boarding on the plane, and those are the things that we want to social network. We want to let our fans know, hey, this is what we're doing. Richard Sherman, he might just be walking up a jetway. Um, and so we want to, when we get on the plane, it's turn on a MiFi so that we can get an internet signal, and it's crank out a photo as quickly as we can. So. Because of that, yeah, there's a lot more immediacy. A lot more immediacy. And in contrast, Brad, can you tell us how it used to be done? Uh, <coughs> yeah. Like the workflow for, you, you, send, you call Whoa. up a photographer, you send him to a new event? It's Russell Wilson. It's Russell Wilson. I thought it was LeBron. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, coach. No, I'm sorry I said that. <laughs> I have no idea what you just said. I'm sorry. Say that again. That's one. I, I think they find it interesting about how the process used to work. Oh, Come, yeah, yeah. In, in contrast to what Rod's doing. Right, exactly. Doing well, but before the, the web. <laughs> I worked at a French news agency in the 80s, and we used to fly film, and it was a French news agency out of Paris, and we, I worked in the New York office, and we would fly film on the Concorde. We'd get photos, and we'd process it, and then we'd put on a package on the Concorde, and, and ship it back and forth. And then I would get things that were shot around the country, around the world, Europe mostly, in, in all kinds of uh, platforms. And they would send the photos back in these big boxes of slides that they printed in Paris and captioned in Paris. And they would arrive the next day on a Concorde. Then I would walk over, literally walk over to Newsweek and Time and magazines like that and pull out these photos. And the person would look at it with a loop up to the light. and and give me a guarantee, I'll take $500 for Princess Di or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And that's how we, we sold the photos. It was as simple as that. We, we showed this stuff like that. And it seemed, at the time, it seemed like this really fast-paced world. <laughs> <laughs> wow, this was just in Europe like two days ago. <laughs> that sounds so cool. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to say that, awesome. like, right? The Concorde and like, yeah. going through the streets of Paris. Like, that sounds so, so cool. That was pretty good. Um, and then I briefly ran film out of Beirut during the war for that same agency where I was just stupid enough to say yes and I went to Beirut and I would bring film back to to because uh, they needed somebody to carry it back to Paris and I would drop off the film from all the war photographers in Paris and then go back to New York after a certain amount of time um, so it, at the time it was you know whatever you're in is like really hectic and fast it's not like Everybody was taking a nap 20 years ago. I mean, we all thought we were working hard. It just, <laughs> if you look back now, you have no idea how it exhausted you so, but compared to what it is now. But it, even when I was first, the first time I worked at Sports, this is my third time at Sports Illustrated. And uh, when I first worked there, it was 1989. And when they worked there in 1989, there was only a magazine, there was nothing else, there was no website. There was nothing. There was an internal newsletter. So I, there was two publications. Um, it was four pages. It was excellent. And um, um, we just did the magazine. And we would do exactly like Rod said. We would shoot a game on Sunday, football games all around the country on Sundays. And we would courier them. We would put the film on into an envelope. 
Jack Fox envelopes. And then uh, they would get shipped, not the person, just the film, get shipped back to New York. It would get there Monday morning. We'd process film in, you know, after in Monday morning. And then we'd all come in early and we'd come down on this dumb waiter and we'd all grab the, the bags of film and go back to our office and edit on the light tables and show right after a game. And that's, that's kind of how it was done. And then the magazine closed late at night on Monday. And we still do the same thing in principle. It's just that now they shoot a game and they just ingest cards while they're getting you know, their equipment ready. And then all the cards are back and everything and the 3,000 images instead of on a dumb waiter are coming to a dumb editor <laughs> back, in, uh, back in New York. And they just, they just load up on your computer and you just edit from there. So it's done, the principle of it hasn't changed, it's just the technology of it's changed. And in order to do so, we want to feed all those platforms now that Rod spoke of, which is social media as well as the online uh, group as well. Is so, that obviously that's probably a big push, I'm assuming? Yeah, and, and like the platforms Rod was just naming with all the things that his photos can end up uh, participating in, it's the same thing for mine. I have so many things that I have to oversee, which is everything from the social media campaign to the uh, we have more titles than SI. We also have a kids magazine, and we have the two golf magazines, and and uh, so forth, and then the web and everything else. So we're trying to get everything in house in the tablet form, in house as soon as possible to feed all those places as, mm -hmm. as quickly as possible. And uh, we try to compete. One of our things that we try to do is we basically compete with the wires when we're at a big event because if I have a guy writing a story on you know Michigan Ohio State game or whatever and. I have a guy at the game, when the photo runs, it just sits there for like hours, that one photo, and that's it. I don't want it to say, you know, another source, Getty or AP or whatever. I want it to say, you know, my guys for Sports Illustrated. I mean, that's my goal. And when I came to back to SI as the director <coughs> two years ago, I completely overhauled the workflow because before two years ago, they weren't doing that. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to compete with those wires and have our images there because it's about the branding and I want people to see Sports Illustrated was at the game and know that we're there. I'm, I'm, it's not my job to push the brand of the Associated Press. It's my job to push the Sports Illustrated brand. So. Nice. Nothing against the Associated Press. <laughs> uh, I'd like to hear what like a typical week is for each of you. Rod, I'd like to hear some, are there, you got some good stories from the bus you can share with us? Um, well, like my week, <laughs> I don't know, does a, does a week end on Sunday? I think the week <laughs> ends. You define that. The, the week ends with the game in, in, in the NFL. Like, everything leads up to the game. And so Monday is spent, like, I'll spend right after the game Sunday night. I'll, I have an editor, and she'll crank out photos during the game so that I can keep shooting. So we're running cards back to her. And um, she's a former journalist as well, Jenny Buchanan. And so she's great at <coughs> editing and making all my selects. On Monday, I will be go back through the take and start looking for stuff that we want to put in our file. They might be ISO isolated pictures of players that we can use for cutouts or future tickets. These aren't necessarily the game telling photos, but are photos, fan photos, stadium photos, all the kind of file stuff that we need for the rest of the week or for the rest of the year, or just simply to document as part of our team's history, which is also something that I'm always trying to keep in mind as well as just whatever the last play was. Um, Tuesday is the player's day off, so I'm not at our facility, but I'm working on, we do a photo blog on our own website, so I usually do that on Tuesday. And then the team practices on Wednesday and Thursday, so I photograph practices, and it's like, why do we photograph practices? That's something that we didn't do before the web, but there are practice galleries because we have fans all over the country, actually all over the world now, who want to just see photos, so we just you know put out a quick 10 to 20 photo gallery. Um, and then before you know it, the week during the football season goes so fast, then it's Friday. And if we're going to the East Coast, we're leaving on Friday. Um, if we're at home, then there's a, a practice. And then Saturday is usually easy if I'm at home. And then if we're on the road, we're on the road. And then Sunday's the game, and we do it again. And those 20 weeks of the season, and if you're fortunate to get out into the playoffs, it can be 23, 24 weeks. Um, it goes by in an absolute blur. An absolute blur. Are you taking this this off season off then, or or they have you doing other work? Well, the the thing about the new CBA, the collective bargaining agreement, is the players actually have defined times off now, and so there's I'm sure there were, but now they're very clearly defined, like when they can be in Sicily, when they can't, when you can have practices, when you can have your mini camp. So the next thing I'll do will be the NFL draft, 
and then we'll have mini camps after that. <clears throat> and then once we get into the end of July, we'll be at training camp. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Gotcha. But meanwhile, I'm still a freelancer. Like I'm, I'm on a contract right. with the Seahawks, but I still have other clients that I serve. So last week I was in Los Angeles right. photographing a UFC fight. <clears throat> um, this weekend I'll be photographing the Pac-12 women's basketball tournament. Seattle next week. I just asked the men's you to tournament. something the other day, right? Yep. Yeah. Yep. So yeah. So life goes on. Life goes on. Mm -hmm. Lots of clients. I I'm fortunate enough to get to do Special Olympics and Make a Wish, both of which are causes that are very dear to me. And so anytime they call, it's like so fun to go out and do those things. And so yeah, it's great. Very fortunate. My week starts on uh, Tuesdays. The magazine closes Monday evening, so that's the end of my week. Is Monday. Um, I work in the office. I work Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. That's it. I work four days a week. I don't live in the city. I have to commute in. So uh, I commute in four days a week. And I, Tuesday, we have a, an edit meeting. And we sit around a table like this. Not as nice as this, but a <laughs> table like this. And um, we go over the stories for that week. It's pretty simple. These are the eight stories we're doing, and this is what we're projecting to do. And I have enough sense to know if we're doing five features on athletes, we don't run five action photos to, as the lead for each one. So we have to start thinking about shooting a couple of portraits to mix it up. And then I have a staff meeting with my, with my photo staff, and then we make assignments. They, my photo staff makes no assignments that don't come through me first. Um, they discuss it with me, or they at least let me know. Now it's, it's a casual enough where I'm going to hire so-and-so, is that okay, is kind of the conversation. But I want to know all the assignments they make before they make them. Um, because at the end of the day, it's my responsibility as the director, and I'm in charge of the budget, among other things, so I really want to make sure I know what we're doing. So that's on Tuesday, we make all the assignments, and then uh, um, I, Wednesday, Saturday, and Sunday, I am never not answering emails or working emails or talking to people on the phone. There's never a day that I don't do something because we don't just have photo assignments Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. They're happening other days. And a lot of things happen with these photo assignments. They fall through, they brought somebody they weren't supposed to, whatever, and all these things have to just kind of be discussed. And then we make kind of a plan on where these photos are going, whether there's going to be a gallery that goes with it because we have enough <coughs> stuff from shooting a rodeo, for instance, or whatever, and we can create a gallery. And so my edit week on the Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday in the office is primarily just making sure things are flowing and that the trains are running on time. That's, that's the important thing is we have a deadline and it's a fast deadline. The magazine closes and you can't be late. And if you're going to be late, then you have to have a backup plan. So I mean, that's, that's my main objective is to make sure that everything is seen when it's supposed to be seen and everything that isn't will be and that we move forward in a, in a timely fashion. Like any other magazine, we close things on different days, and a lot of things are in advance. We want to close them early just because it's cost saving and so forth. So I have to pay attention to those. And then over the weekend on Saturday and Sunday, I'm kind of formulating where we're going to be going the next week. And I think ahead. A lot of the time I spend thinking bigger picture out front, not just the weekly issue. I spend a good part of my time. Uh, planning. I've already just, I'm now assigning and planning for the World Championships for gymnastics, which is in Glasgow, swimming in Russia, and track and field in China this summer. And I'm working on that. I've been to Brazil twice in the, in the last year, and Korea not long ago, all for future Olympics that we have to go through. All things that are way down the road, years ahead of time. But nonetheless, we have to go to meetings, and we have to discuss those things, logistics and everything. So a lot of that time is just spent planning. And then um, every night, around midnight, I walk my dog. That's my, <laughs> that's my dog. The day. I never walk the early morning. I, I just can't do it. But I, I do the, the, night, the midnight one, just throwing that out there in case my wife is listening. So <laughs> I do walk the dog. Uh, so obviously, <clears throat> like all publishing industries, had some economic challenges. <clears throat> Here comes the question, Brad. The Sports Illustrated laid off the staff photographers, and I'm curious what you can share with us about the reasoning behind it, how you're moving forward. Are those photographers being rehired on contract? You know, what, what can you throw out there? What I can tell you is those uh, six photographers contributed a great deal, and they are part of our legacy, and they're part of our uh, product, and they made the magazine as great as it is. Um, uh, moving forward, uh, there's a large pool of photographers in the country and around the world, of which those six will be a part of that group. 
that we'll choose from every single week as we move forward and hire photographers. Uh, we have never not existed with freelance photographers and we couldn't exist without freelance photographers. There's this newspaper couldn't exist without freelance photographers. Um, it, it just, it would, it would collapse. You don't have enough staffers on staff to shoot everything if you wanted to. And no newspaper does. So that's no different than our magazine. We've always used freelancers. We will continue to do so. And uh, hopefully uh, those six will continue to contribute. I certainly, I certainly hope so. I value their talents and, and hope we can move forward with that. That's my answer. That was well done. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to ask Rod, what, what are the qualities that make a good editor that you like to work with? And in, in opposite view, Brad, what are the qualities of a good photographer? Professional. You, you go yeah, first. Professional. <laughs> I will say this, and this is not just abject <laughs> sucking up. There has never been a take that I have not sent to Sports Illustrated where they have not come back with every select that needs to be selected. And I know their editors are flying through images. Um, so if I'm, if I'm working for Brad and I'm shooting a baseball game or, or football or whatever it is, we send low-res JPEGs to them, and they'll edit them, and they'll send you a list back of selects. And you always kind of wonder as a photographer, you know, you're like, if you, if you take the time to look through your take, like, oh, I really like that one. I hope they pick that one. Like, after the first time I worked for them, it was amazing. I mean, every single time, but my doubt was erased after the first time I got my list of selects back. They don't <coughs> miss images, and it is the coolest thing. Um, I'm spoiled with my editor right now because I'm old enough that I mentored her as she was coming up as a photographer in college and into her own newspaper job. And she left newspapers to become a full-time photo editor. But um, she sees the way I see. And so I'm fortunate enough that she looks through and she's looking for storytelling images. She's looking for faces. She's looking for great moments. So what I look for from a photo editor is, are you finding the storytelling moments? Are you finding the best moments? Are you do I get the feeling that you understand what I'm trying to do, what I'm trying to see? Because they see all your blemishes. They see your misses. And remember, you're gonna shoot 3,000 photos and they're gonna send you a list of you know a couple of hundred selects and maybe three might make the magazine and that's if you hit the lottery. Like it might, you know, they've got various reasons for why they run something in the magazine, but you know, can't, are, do I think do I have an understanding that they are trying to understand how I'm seeing? And like I said, they see you're out of focus, they see your blinks, they see your missed exposures, your crappy backgrounds, I mean, they see it all. But sometimes they understand that the background's bad because you're working towards this. And sometimes, especially with an athlete or when you're doing portraits, you're trying to get them to point C. But in order to get them to point C, you can't start at point C. You have to go point A and then point B and you're establishing trust and sometimes you're just taking pictures so that the flash is going off and so that they're getting comfortable and you're trying to establish whatever commonality or whatever you know sort of understanding that you're going to have in those. We only get five minutes with an athlete so you know whatever you're going to do in that five minutes does the editor understand that and are they getting to the right thing and then the last thing is when they find something that I didn't see. And you look at it and you go, oh, yeah. See, that's why they're a photo editor, and that's why I take the picture. Because they see it. They found it. They saw it right away. I think that um, uh, Rod hit it on the head as far as, um, as far as there has to be a relationship. You have to kind of understand what they're trying to achieve on that end. And they have to understand what you're trying to achieve on your end and you work together. And if you're on different pages, then you'll only work together once. Um, because I really, I just, I don't have the time to sit here and let this be a working relationship that needs to be nurtured for a long period of time because I only have 50 something issues a year that come out and I, I can't, if I get it wrong too many times, then I'm looking for a job, you know? So you have to work with people that you trust and you work with. Um, uh, on a regular basis, it's very helpful to have a relationship with them. I will say that the best qualities that I find in photographers, uh, especially at this point in my life that I'm older, low maintenance is right up there at the top. <laughs> um, I would say that a, uh, a general kind of 
sincere enthusiasm and curiosity about what they're getting ready to go shoot. Or, you know, they, they're actually interested and excited about it without being a puppy, but you know, I mean, very excited and, and to the degree that, yeah, sure, well, that'd be cool, thanks. That's really kind of all I want to hear. And that works out well. They need to be able to think on their feet. They need to be able to um, take what I give them and realize that after I told them that <coughs> Russell Wilson will be at home with his wife and his dog, that in fact, it, he's not married and lives in an apartment, and I got it all wrong. And that happens a lot. The information I get from a writer or somebody, and it's very often transferred to Rod or, or any photographer, and I will tell him, go here, he's gonna meet at this bar, and you just take a picture of him. It's a sports bar, and they have a wall with his pictures on it, and he gets there. There's no pictures on the wall. It's like one picture behind the cash register. That actually and, happened, yeah. yeah. That was so, Sean Kemp. Sean Kemp. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then two little kids showed up and said, Dad. So, anyway. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, it, it's you have to be able to kind of think on your feet as a photographer. And I know that that's going to be part of the equation, and they have to be able to problem solve. That's part of the equation. And I know there are times where they need to call me and discuss things, but I also know that I don't need to be called for every, that's the part about the low maintenance, where they can figure, they're adults, they can figure it out on their own, they can take a picture. I hire photographers because I trust their vision of the photo they're going to take. That's why I hire certain people to take certain photos. Um, there isn't hardly a photographer in the world that doesn't think, oh, I could have shot that. I'm sure they say that about it, and it's human nature. It's probably in every business that happens, right? I'm sure every writer at this newspaper thinks, oh, I could have written that. You know, I could have done that Pulitzer Prize winning story. You know, I mean, that's just nature of it. We're, you're competitive and, and you're talented and that's why you're doing it. And, but there's a reason an editor picks this person instead of this person. You have to kind of go with it and you trust your instincts and you're on the same page. But I, I love working with photographers that have creative ideas on their own that will complement the idea that I am bringing from a meeting with 12 people that really want to see it fulfilled. Um, a really quick example, we shot something in uh, Boston where we shot um, uh, David Ortiz after the after the bombings in Boston. And then, as you remember or not, the Red Sox won the World Series that year. <clears throat> so the bombing is in April, and they win the World Series in October, November, whatever. And at some point, we posed David Ortiz with the four, uh, with the three policemen that we had on the cover that were responding to the bombing. And, um, and they, were, they were great. The police department was really helpful and, and the Red Sox helped. We shot it at Fenway and everything was great. I had a meeting like this with my bosses and I'm talking to them and we said, why don't we do this, okay? And I know I can still hear it in my head. My boss was very clear. I want to see David Ortiz right in the middle. And I said, okay, sounds like a great idea, blah, blah, blah. Not one frame is David Ortiz in the middle. And I told the photographer to shoot it. And, but he said, once I got there, there isn't. And I said, I said, and I said to the photographer very clearly, I said, you've got to have some frames in the middle because my boss wants to see those. But I'm telling you, in my head, the picture is David Ortiz is off to the side. And the reason he's off to the side is because he's a baseball player. And these three people saved lives. And these three people are clearly the heroic figures in this photo, not the baseball player. So I want him to the side in deference to these three. But make sure you get some in the middle so I can show them because <laughs> I'll give my boss the illusion of a choice. <laughs> or so I thought. Not one frame is he in the middle. Not one frame. And he's annoyed at me, and he should be. I was wrong. It was, it was, I take responsibility even though I wasn't there. It's still my fault. There was no picture. And you have, to, you have to convey that. This is my idea, and this is another idea. Now you do what you want, and we'll somehow meet in the middle. And sure, he did what he wanted, and he did what I wanted, and he didn't do what my boss wanted. <laughs> and so luckily it turned out okay, because in the end it was still the better picture, and, and everybody agreed it was the better one. But you have, to, you have to fill all those needs. You can't go on a photo shoot and be told, I need a picture of him. I don't care what happens. You have to shoot him on this couch, because his mother gave him that couch. So make sure you shoot him on this couch. And then you send back 50 photos, and he's in a chair. And you're like, what the? So then you're like, you have to make sure that the photographer fills those needs. And, and they, I need to work with photographers that I trust will get all those components all at once. And then we'll put them on a table. And then I get paid to decide which one works best. So then we go from there. I hope that answers that.
well. How do you find photographers like Rod? How are you doing that now? Um, well, it, it's, it's any number of, of ways. I teach at uh, a number of workshops around the country. Uh, Eddie Adams, the Summit Workshops in Colorado. Uh, there's one in Palm Beach and, and a couple other ones. I do lectures and whatever. So I meet people through those for sure. Um, a lot of it is word of mouth where other people in the business, I just had a portfolio come through here, it's really more stuff you might be interested in. Photo editors talk and pass names along. Um, I have schools that bring like their entire you know relationship with schools, they bring them to the office and say hi, journalism schools, and I meet them through that. But you know, day to day, um, I get obviously a large amount of emails and um, promo cards in the mail and so forth sent to me. So they kind of come from like all over the world, you know, and I, I don't know if there's any one place that works best. I personally react better to the promo card that I can hold in my hand and look at and sit on my desk for a while than the, the email. I think the emails are just kind of mass generated to everybody on their mailing list and I understand this is my newest project, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, it's all good. I mean, it's always kind of interesting. I try to look at them, but I can't look at them all, that's for sure. But um, a lot of them, newer photographers, tend, a lot of them from these workshops. And I often think to myself, not now, but in a few years, this is somebody I want to keep a, an eye on. And um, I have a, uh, a map in my office, and I pin little things to the maps for people to kind of keep an eye on. One of the, if I can just like expand on that really quickly, as we're all kind of running out of money here, left and right, you know, it's just not the, the, the publication or publishing business that it was 25 years ago or whatever. You know, we're all looking for ways to be a little more fiscally responsible and it just makes sense. And for a magazine that's national, that means travel. That's my largest, it's every publication's largest cost is, is travel and uh, putting somebody on a plane and a hotel and a rental car and meals and blah, 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 this costs a lot of money. And if I can find somebody who lives in Seattle to shoot something, mm -hmm. then it's a lot better for me than flying somebody, obviously, from Detroit to Seattle. I mean, why would I do that if I have somebody there? So I try to find somebody within a reasonable region that'll still live up to the standards I need in those areas as much as possible. So that's really what I do more than anything else is try to regionalize as much as possible. And that just doesn't extend to Sports Illustrated, right? That extends across <coughs> all aspects of freelance photography. I, I have a client who's got me shooting this weekend in Seattle for the Pac-12 and the men's tournament's in Las Vegas. And I've, I've not shot the, the tournament in Las Vegas for them because they use a local person. Well, they've decided this year they want to make a change. They've looked at some people and then they've called and said, okay, we want to invest the money and we're going to send you. But this is on a week's notice. Like they've had a year and they've probably <coughs> been looking at photographers in that area or in the people right. they want aren't available, people they use, they decide they want to make a change. So, you know, it's very much the budgets and the air, the travel is a big, big deal. It is. It, yeah. It's a huge part of my budget. Yeah. And when I look at, you know, what that costs, it, it's thousands of dollars literally to just put somebody in a plane. Because the first thing you hear is, how much is the plane ticket? That's the first thing I ask, right? And it's always, you know, it's $448. Okay, sure. And you think, oh, this is only going to cost, wait, no, it's not. And then it takes you compute it. And it costs thousands of dollars to send someone anywhere to do anything because, you know, they're putting their money out and you have to pay them back. That's how it works. So if any time you can eliminate that, what that does is, that money that I would have spent on sending somebody somewhere instead of hiring local people, and once I hire local people, it gives me the opportunity to do more assignments, to go out there and hire more days for more assignments. <coughs> and I don't have to pick up the wires, or I can just go on a lark on a project that I'd like to do, or here's a photo essay, let's go ahead and do it. Instead of, I have no money left because I sent somebody to Alaska, you know, so it, it's, it's, a, it's a huge thing. You, photographers in general, it's not necessarily that they're working less, but they're certainly not traveling as much, that's for sure, as they used to in an era that seems to have maybe slipped away. So 